The house sound has been polluted over years by various different activities. Early days there was a, a very big uh, copper mine up in Britannia and the copper mine actually created the highest point source of pollution in North America at the time. The other big industry on house sound has been logging over the years and there's been a couple of mills up in Squamish Way, wood fibre and uh, consequently which is also closed now. Squamish Dreamkeepers were originally formed when, when the coal stocks went down. Uh, there are streamkeeper groups formed all over the coast to try and help bring back the freshwater lifespan of coho. Uh, but along the way, we also started working in the ocean. Uh, there used to be a, a big uh, herring run in Howe Sound. It used to spawn in the Masheter uh, Blind Channel. When they put a large sawmill in there in the late 60s, uh, overnight, the herring, 500,000 herring died off. Within about five years, the herring run had virtually disappeared. Uh, the uh, eelgrass beds that they uh, had spawned on disappeared as well. So we never saw herring in Howe Sound after about the mid 70s. The watchmen at the Squamish terminals noticed herring milt around the dock. And he asked us to go investigate. We happened to be there at low tide. We went under the dock, and here were millions and millions and millions of herring eggs on creosote pilings. Virtually all of them died. Creosote pilings are used to support docks. Because wood can be eaten by worms called teredo worms, they put creosote on the outside to inhibit the teredo worms and other life forms from eating up the, uh, the piling. So it extends the life of the piling dramatically. Uh, the problem is it also kills good things <laughs> that want to spawn on there, such as herring eggs. But now we've learned that we can turn these bad pilings into good pilings just by putting superficial coatings on them that work to the herring's benefit. So we wrapped a lot of the pilings with plastic, black plastic like you use in the construction to prevent the creosote seeping out and affecting the eggs. And then we covered that with a weed control material, thinking that'll give a nice soft base for the herring to spawn on. And to our astonishment, we came back a week or so later, this material was plastered with eggs, and they all hatched out as best we could tell. So then, that for the next year, we went and did every single piling we could access, about 170 pilings that we could get to at very low tides. We wrapped them with the plastic and the weed control material, and we even ran some of the weed control material in between the pilings. And lo and behold, almost 100% hatch out. We've uh, just had a soil remediation on uh, Britannia mine. Same thing with wood fiber. Wood fiber is also cleaned up. We still have another mill operating up Port Mellon, but that's uh, probably one of the cleanest mill sites in North America. They've, they've really done a really good job of cleaning up their act from being a really, really dirty mill to a much cleaner mill. The house sound is, is actually in a rebirth state. We're seeing that uh, with the industrial cleanups, we're seeing a lot of return of health. We're seeing a lot of indicators of that. There's been a relocated pot of Pacific white-sided dolphins that have returned into the house sound, and uh, that's, that's a whole new event we've never seen before. We had an incredible run of pink salmon just recently, and then we've also had salmon running into all the local streams, even Britannia, which never saw uh, salmon go up in the last 100 years. So I would say it's in a very good state of rebirth right now. Uh, again, this is a precarious state. If the industry continues on at the rate it is, uh, I'm afraid that we won't see the dolphins if there's a gravel mine. We won't see the whales coming back in. And there's actually been some whale sightings right, you know, within, within uh, uh, earshot of where we are right now. So I, I really do think that there's some good opportunities, but I think if we don't take the opportunity to turn this into more of a tourism area rather than an industrial one, I don't think we're going to enjoy that kind of thing. Now what we're worried about is future stressors. So that might look like something like a proposed gravel mine over in McNabb Creek. And that, that has us seriously concerned. And then there's also stressors of possible a liquefied natural gas facility which is uh, proposed for Squamish at 
current times. So it's more the future we're worried about than the current. They've finally come to the point where the house sound is uh, restoring its health. I think house sound needs to be protected because it's close to the biggest population centre in British Columbia. And if we can't demonstrate good conservation to the populace that lives right next to it, I think we have a really big challenge trying to get to anybody who, who lives outside of the ocean and doesn't see what it is. So I think that's, that's probably one of, one of the things that really makes it important to, to focus on House Sound. House Sound has a lot of tourism, it has a lot of kayaking, it has scuba diving, it's got nature tours, there's a lot going for it. But it's, get, it's getting very challenging because right now we can see that industry is running right up against that. There's a lot people can do to help. People can actually take an interest in it, take the time to become involved with organizations like Marine Life Sanctuary Society of British Columbia. We've got a very active volunteer group that actually goes to the ocean and shows people what's in the ocean. We use divers to go in and they collect things and then we have marine biologists on shore who do interpretations for people and individuals. It takes a lot to run programs like that and the volunteers are, are, are always useful to have and they're always hard to find. The other thing people can do is, is they can actually uh, learn what the rules are so that when they see people doing things that they can actually report to the right governing bodies so that if you see somebody illegally poaching an area you know where to call, who to call, that sort of thing. And that's where we're uh, working on signage programs, we're working on uh, various different ways of educating people with a stewardship program we've got. Our stewardship program actually allows you to go to our website look at the manual and you'll be able to tell what you need to do if you want to be a steward of your own beach. The way other people can help us out is keep your eyes open. When you go walking, especially at low tide, keep your eye on the shorelines. Look at bladder rack and see if you see eggs on them. Herring eggs are tiny, but if you get close enough and look and see and give us a report where you see herring spawn, anywhere in Georgia Basin uh, is potentially a herring spawning area. Typically they require some protection from big winds. They don't like to lay their eggs on areas where waves are going to crash on them. Um, the west side of Georgia Strait is in pretty good shape because they spawn all, all along the um, flats of the east side of Vancouver Island. It's the east side of Georgia Strait where most of the trouble is because wherever there's a protected bay there's usually a marina in there. <laughs> and you'll probably find historically that most of those bays had herring spawning at one time. If we can bring them back in Squamish Harbor and possibly in Falls Creek, why can't you bring them back everywhere?